After a brutal game against Utah, Mika Zibanejad answers the bell and leads the Rangers to a 4-1 to win over the Red Wings. We discuss Mika's big night, and we also talk about an encouraging early season trend for these Rangers. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 1160 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. So I want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you will get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And that intro song you're hearing, or we're hearing, is, of course, Leave the Lights On from our good friends in Pacifier. You can check those guys out anywhere you get your music. So just as sure as we gave Mika Zibanej at a little bit of a hard time in our last episode following his, uh, I mean, let's just call it like it was, just a a dreadful performance against Utah. Uh, We, by that same token, have to give him credit for stepping up in a big way, just a complete 180 for Mika Zibanejad from the Utah game to this game. I think this was easily the best game that he's played so far this season. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, the goal that he scored was an empty netter. It doesn't really count. Even if you feel that way, fine, whatever. It it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that this is the best game that Mika Zibanejad has played. To begin with, it was just nice to see Mika Zibanejad shooting the puck a little bit more often. In fact, quite a bit more often. You look at the game against Pittsburgh. Now, the Rangers beat the Penguins on opening night, 6-0 in Pittsburgh. And while that was obviously a a really fun night for all of us, when you consider that that was the first game of the season, you consider the fact that the Rangers are going up against, you know, a bitter rival in the Penguins, and they basically just rolled. That was awesome. But Mika Zibanejad, in a game where the Rangers scored six goals and basically dominated, completely dominated, the final 50 minutes of that game, he ended up with no shots on goal in that game. And then against Utah, I mean, apart from, you know, a rough showing in overtime and, you know, a a turnover by Mika Zibanejad that led to a Utah goal even in regulation, uh, he only came up with one shot on goal against Utah as well. And again, that's a game where the Rangers are scoring five goals. You just expect a little bit more from your top line center. You expect him to be a little bit more involved, even if the shots aren't necessarily, you know, finding the back of the net, you know, he would at least be, um, you know, firing them at will a little bit more often because he does have such a, a good shot, as we've noted in the past. But yeah, one shot on goal combined for Mika in the first two games. And then this game, Mika tied with Vincent Trocek for most shots on goal by any player in this game with five apiece. And after a quiet, you know, first couple of games here, you know, Mika does end up with his first goal this season. Granted, once again, it was an empty netter, but also the two assists. Uh, he was a plus two in this game, 17 minutes and 10 seconds of ice time. Only Ranger forwards that had more than Mika Zibanejad were Trocek at 25.07 and Panarin at 20.37. But it was nice to see him come through in a big spot. Mika Zibanejad, that is. Obviously, the Rangers were tied 1-1 for a good chunk of this game. And honestly, they were kind of lucky that they didn't fall behind at one time or another. You know, they took the lead in the first period, made it one nothing. Detroit scored with like two seconds to go in the first period after the Rangers fell asleep a little bit. And the Rangers played... Fairly poorly in the second period, if we're being honest here, and it, it turned into the Igor Shesterkin show, and we'll get to that in just a little bit here. Um, but Mika Zibanejad coming through big time late in the second period, a uh, period that, again, the Rangers were, you know, dominated might be too strong of a word, but they were clearly outplayed in the second period, and yet they still won the second period, thanks in part to a play that was made by Mika Zibanejad. To begin with, Rangers were on the power play. This is thanks to Adam Edstrom driving to the Detroit net and catching, you know, a high stick. And that put the Rangers on the main advantage. You got Vincent Trocek winning the faceoff. He gets a little bit of help from Artemi Panarin. Panarin back to Fox. Fox Fox back up to Panarin along the boards. Panarin goes across the ice to Mika Zibanejad. And initially, I thought Mika was shooting and Kreider deflected it, which I guess technically you could word it that way. But when Mika uh, moved this puck in the direction of the net, he was looking for Kreider. This was more of a pass than it was a shot. He was looking for that deflection. We know how... Uh, deadly Kreider is with those, and I, I just don't even know how you defend a play like this when you, you've got the the passing to begin with. The passing was very good, and then Mika put it right where it needed to be for Kreider, and Kreider redirects it into the net. And again, th- there's not much you can do to stop Kreider on plays like this, but Mika's advantage at making it happen, uh, getting it to his BFF in deep there, and setting the Rangers up 
for what turned out to be the game-winning goal. It only took five seconds uh, of power play time here for the Rangers to take the lead and uh, not look back. They were up 2-1 to one at that point in the game. And, you know, while we're talking about Mika, I want to bring up something that I talked about in the last episode because, obviously, you know, Mika Zibanejad had a, had a really rough night against Utah. And in general, I didn't think that first line did much of anything. Didn't think they were really all that noticeable. Uh, a point that I made there, and this one is still somewhat true, but it has more to do with how good the Panarin line is rather than, you know, any deficiencies that the Mika line might have. Uh, I said after the Utah game that the Panarin line, you know, of course, the Trocek and Lafreniere, those guys are basically lapping the Mika line. I mean, they, they have excelled past them by, by such a degree to the point where a lot of you guys, like sometimes you'll kind of get mad at me for re referring to the Mika line as the top line and the Panarin line as the second line. Look, I'm just going by what the depth chart says. I, I don't really read that much farther into it than that. But regardless of how you look at it, the Panarin line, you know, how you, however you want to word it, first line, second line, whatever, the Panarin line has, you know, obviously taken a hop, skip, and a leap past the Mika line. That is for sure. But the other thing that I said after the Utah game was that through two games thus far in the season, the Ranger third line of, you know, Heedle and Cooley and Kako, those guys were actually, I would say, probably outplaying the Ranger top line. And I kind of challenged this Ranger top line to pick it up a little bit, specifically Mika Zibanejad. And they did that in this game. They were a lot more assertive. I think in the third period specifically, this line uh, really played well, spending uh, just about every uh, shift that they had in the offensive zone. We also saw Riley Smith score his first goal as a New York Ranger. We'll get to that in a little bit as well. Um, but... One other thing that I want to point out here while we're talking about the Mika line is I get the feeling, and I know some of you agree with me, and, and maybe I, I might be reading into this a little bit more than I should, but maybe the Rainier coaching staff noticed that as well. Because if you notice, which line in this game got to start all three periods? Well, that was the Rainier third line, Cooley, Heedle, and Kako. And I get the feeling that, you know, Laviolette and the coaching staff, they probably did that more than anything to reward the third line than they did to, like, punish the top line. And it's not the end-all, be-all, you know, which line starts the period and everything. But I think there is something to that. I mean, obviously, you want a good start in every period, and you're going with a line that you trust and you feel is going to go out there and hit the ground running and give you a good first shift and give you something to build off of. And, you know, hopefully get into the offensive zone, and if not, at least defend well. And they were... They were they were going with the third line uh, throughout the entire night last night. That third line started all three periods. A little bit of a message being sent to the Mika line. It's at least possible because that's usually uh, that that's usually their gig. You know, they they usually get to start uh, periods, and they didn't get to do it in this game. So, uh, but, but like I said, I think it was more to reward the third line than anything. But I wouldn't just brush it aside either. Be very curious to see which line starts the next one. I, I feel like it could go back to the third line, or maybe you go back to the Mika line, given that you know they obviously played better in this game than they probably had in either of the uh, preceding two games. And I know, look, Cryer scored two goals on opening night. I get that. But for me, complete as a whole, this was easily Mika Zibanejad's best game. And I would say as a whole, uh, that entire line's best game. You know, we're, we're only three games in here, but of the three, I think this was uh, number one for that top line for the Rangers. So going to keep everything rolling just a second here. I want to shift our attention to the Rangers, a very encouraging, positive early season trend that I'm kind of noticing from this team, and some of you probably have as well. Uh, we will get to that in just a second. Also going to be talking about Igor Shesterkin and uh, some lineup decisions going forward as well, and uh, we'll do all that fun stuff in just a second. All right, we just want to take a minute to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You will get started with $200 in bonus bets, guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That is a FanDuel dot com. All right, let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here on Locked On New York Rangers. Huge shout out to the everydayers as always. Uh, thank you guys, you know, for, for supporting the show and sticking with Locked On Rangers throughout every part of the NHL calendar. For the everydayers, we got in our next episode, this episode's actually already been recorded. We'll be talking all about the Ranger prospects. That's going to be Wednesday's episode. Uh, we also hear from Heidi and Sebastian from Locked On NHL prospects. They do an awesome job with their show. Definitely recommend checking it out. Some of you probably already have, but uh, if you haven't, definitely uh, give that a listen if you have time. And uh, then on Thursday, going to be doing an episode on why I think the Rangers should look to extend uh, Alexi Lafreniere 
as quickly as possible. Like, like literally do it today kind of thing. But um, we'll get to that on Thursday. For right now, let's keep the focus on this game. The trend I was talking about, I, I kind of teased it during the intro to the show, and I, I mentioned it just a second ago. Um, the, the, the thing that I'm seeing that's, that's very, very encouraging, and I think some of you will agree with me, the Rangers seem to be at their best in the third period. They are putting their best foot forward in crunch time when it really matters the most. This was one of the biggest reasons why the Rangers had as much success as they did last season. You don't end up with the best record in the NHL. You don't end up with the President's Trophy if you are not excelling in crunch time. And the Rangers did that uh, time and time again last year. All these dramatic, you know, rallies in the third period. Or maybe you just go into the third period tied and, you know, you prevail there. You prevail in overtime. You prevail in a shootout, whatever it might be. Or you're only up by a goal. You manage to, to hang on to a lead in a situation like that. But the bottom line, we have seen the Rangers, you know, a lot of comeback wins last season. And this one wasn't necessarily a comeback win, but they were still at their best in the third period when they needed to be. And we've seen that, like I said, through all three games here. We, we can start with Pittsburgh. Uh, now that game, it wasn't exactly crunch time. It wasn't like it's not going to go down as like the most clutch moment of the season for the Rangers because when the third period started in Pittsburgh, the Rangers were already up four to nothing. But even still, you know, they continued to play well. They didn't take their foot off the gas. They wanted to, uh, you know, certainly preserve the shutout and frankly embarrass the Penguins. And that's exactly what they did. They had another two goals in the third period. They defended well in front of Igor Shesterkin, and they won that game six nothing. Then the game against Utah and the Raiders were clearly not at their best on this night. You have to give some credit to Utah. That looks like a vastly improved team. They were three, you know, I believe they lost to the devils last night, but uh, certainly seems like a team that's going in the right direction. But for all the, the chaos of that game and all the goals that the Rangers allowed and all the mistakes that they made, uh, they did go into the third period of that game down five to four and they found a way to tie it and get it into overtime and at least salvage a point out of it. So that's encouraging too. And I mean, Hey, they had given up, five goals to Utah in the first two periods and they didn't give up any in the third period. So even in a game with all that chaos and all that scoring happening, the Rangers at least found a way to tighten things up in the third period. And uh, like I said, at least salvage a point. And then of course you've got this game. Now the Rangers did have a lead going into the third period. They were up two to one, but this was just a completely different team in the third period. Just a lot more assertive. There was no more of that stick checking and just kind of reaching for the puck and guys getting caught stationary in the defensive zone. They got in the, on the four check a lot better. They just look quicker, faster and hungrier in the third period. than certainly they did in the second period. The second period was kind of a mess for the Rangers in this game. You could probably make the argument that it's I would say probably the weakest period that they've played thus far uh, in, in this very young season. You know, I, I guess you could maybe throw out the second period against Utah, but then again, they scored some goals there and uh, they got into all these fights. I mean, for as, as much of a mess as that Utah game was at times and as chaotic as that second period was, at least the Rangers were right in the game in this one. Uh, I don't know what happened. You know, they got back on their heels. They gave up that goal at the end of the first period and that tied the game at 1-1. With two seconds left, Dylan Larkin scoring. So maybe that kind of carried over into the second period. But uh, yeah, the Rangers just, um, they, they didn't have, they, they weren't able to get into fifth gear in the second period. Um, but Igor Shosturkin was there. That That's the good news. Igor was there in the clutch in the second period. Uh, a couple of these saves that he made in the middle period were just ridiculous. Uh, had to make a really tough pad save on Lucas Raymond after Raymond got to the center of the ice. And then we had our old friend, Tyler Bott. He basically, and nothing against Mott, but this guy's a fourth line player for the majority of his career. And he's able to go coast to coast, you know, just weaving through the neutral zone, going past all these Ranger players. Guys are just kind of reaching out with their sticks, not taking the body. Tyler Mott's a tenacious player, but he's certainly not the biggest guy on the ice. You should be able to do something to slow him down. And the Rangers weren't able to do that. So Mott basically went, coast to coast, got a shot in deep, and Igor fought that one off as well. And it looked like Igor had something to say to his teammates uh, after that one as well. Uh, you know, Mott on that play was able to get around Brodzinski, and Man Mancini and Jones were on the ice as well, but there just wasn't a whole lot of resistance on the part of the Rangers. Um, and then you had the old Rangers special. They got up two to one, as we mentioned, in the second period, and then a not-so-good shift right after this. Philip Hedl has been awesome to start the season, but he had a rough turnover here. He had the puck in the Rangers zone, was going to just skate it out of the zone, and basically um, it, it was Lucas Raymond just took the puck right away from him going in the opposite direction. Raymond's along the boards, you know, kind of near the corner there. He centers it for Comfer, Comfer with the redirection, and a fantastic save. Maybe the best one of the night for Igor Shesterkin. Uh, Igor has to move to his left, makes just a ridiculous point-blank glove save to prevent the old Ranger special of giving up a goal right after, you know, a goal has been scored. And, and that preserved a two-to-one lead. Uh, and, you know, 
All this, again, happened after the Rangers gave up a, a bad goal late in the first period. You just don't want to see that happen with two seconds to go. Maybe there's a little bit of a carryover effect there. I'm not sure. But you look at this second period, you know, the Red Wings outshot the Rangers 14 to 10 in that period. Igor was very, very busy. And then they basically just flipped the script in the third period. The Rangers, like I said, they were absolutely buzzing. Uh, They were on the attack up two to one going into the third period. And I think something that, you know, we've talked about before on this podcast that that's worth repeating here is You know, when you're up by a goal, I think specifically in the third period and time's starting to dwindle a little bit, you have to find sort of that, that balance that, 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 you know, in between area where you're staying aggressive, you're still looking to add on to your lead, um, but you're not overdoing it. You're not taking too many chances. You're not certainly giving up any odd man rushes. You have to stay aggressive while also being defensively responsible. And I think the Rangers did a nice job uh, of doing that. You know, when you get in a four check and you go to work and, and, you know, whoever you're, Whoever's on the ice for Detroit is expanding all this energy, trying to win a board battle behind their own net. That's going to work in your favor because by the time Detroit, you know, if they're able to get the puck out of their zone, they got to dump the puck in the Rangers zone, go off for a change. And that's just not a way uh, to produce any offense. And Detroit really didn't have any, really any quality scoring opportunities in the third period. There was a stat where Detroit uh, with only about six minutes to go in the third period, they only had four shots on goal. Uh, for that entire period, which speaks to how well the Rangers were defending and what a 180 it was from the previous period. So that was obviously very nice to see. Um, Rangers, like I said, they stepped it up in basically every facet of the game in the third period. And they also added on to their lead, which is great to see as well. Big time goal by Riley Smith, his first as a member of the New York Ranger. He picked up his first assist of the season in Pittsburgh, but this is his first goal. Uh, to kind of break this one down here. Smith, so I should actually back up because Smith had a really good chance in the second period to add on to the Ranger lead. What happened was it was the end of a power play for the Rangers and they didn't score. So the second unit was out there. So you had kind of like this hybrid line that was on the ice for the Rangers, but you had Philip Heedle passing out of the corner in front to Riley Smith. Smith kind of just stuck behind everybody and, and kind of just got lost, I think. Um, but he was there looking for the redirection into the net. The only thing that stopped it from being a goal was a really nice save by Lyon. But Smith obviously stayed with it. And he ends up, like I said, with his first goal of the season uh, on this play here in the third period. You've got Mika Zibanejad winning a faceoff clean. Uh, Smith picks it up. It's in the right circle in the offensive zone. Smith picks it up, moving to his left, fires a shot and scores, makes it three to one, gives the Rangers a little bit of breathing room. But even after that, I really feel like the Rangers, again, they, they found that that perfect balance of staying aggressive, but not overdoing it and not, you know, certainly compromising yourself defensively with a two-goal lead in the third period. I thought they did that almost to perfection in the third period in this game. And then, of course, you had the Mika Zibanejad empty netter to seal it. So he gets to uh, wrap up his big night with his third point of the game. This is actually a really funny sequence here in the third period because Rangers are up by two goals, and we know how this goes at this point. We, we've seen Igor Shesterkin look to score goals, come within you know a foot, maybe even a matter of inches to scoring goals on an empty net in the past. And the Raiders had the puck. You know, Detroit's net is empty. The Raiders had the puck in Detroit's zone for a long time, and they're, they're trying to bury it, and Detroit's blocking some shots. And once or twice, maybe the Rangers shot wide. And then, of course, they're, they're kind of playing keep away, too. You know, you want to score that empty netter, but you also want to grind down the clock a little bit. Then the puck comes out into the neutral zone, and Keandre Miller had it. And you could tell that there were some fans kind of yelling, like, you know, wanting to see him pass back to Igor Shesterkin. And... I mean, he could have, but you also don't want to get caught playing with your food, so to speak. And and you certainly don't want to, uh, you know, make a mockery of your opponent. Not that that's really what would be do- happening here, but to, to pass back to your goalie and have your goalie then try to shoot at the empty net, that might be a little bit excessive. Um, so Miller didn't do that, but the bottom line, he got to Truba, uh, Truba to Panarin, and then Panarin to Mika. And then finally, the Rangers score on the empty net, and uh, Mika Zibanejad caps off his big night. But yeah, very, very impressed by what the Rangers did in the third period. And it's never too early in a season to kind of uh, establish yourself as that team, that team that's going to be at its best when it absolutely must be, even on a night when things didn't necessarily go perfectly well for you. And of course, some of that was the Rangers' own doing. I thought the Rangers defended, you know, poorly in the second period. But man, did they step it up when they needed to. And that's what good teams do. And like I said, such a staple of this team last year. And they're already starting to kind of... uh, reestablish their identity as a, as a team that's going to be at its best in the third period. And that's when you need to be at your best. So going to keep everything rolling just a second. I'm going to shift our attention to some lineup decisions for the New York Rangers. Specifically, when will we see Jonathan Quick for the first time this season? 
uh, what the Rangers should, could, and ultimately will do with Matt Rempe going forward, and one or two other things as well uh, before we call it a day. And we're going to do all that fun stuff, like I said, in just a second. All right, we just want to take a minute to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Hims. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you with access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. Hims provides access to a range of doctor trusted ED treatments like chewable hard mints and Viagra and Cialis and their generics for up to 95% cheaper. The process is 100% online, so there is no need for uncomfortable doctor's visits. Just answer a series of questions on their site, and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you in discreet packaging for free. No insurance is needed, and one low price covers everything from treatments to ongoing care. With hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers, Hims can help you find the ED option that works for you. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash locked on. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash locked on. For your personalized ED treatment options, hymns.com slash locked on. The products mentioned are chewable compound products, which are not approved by or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. All right, let's go ahead and keep everything going here on Locked On New York Rangers. Figure we can close out today by talking a little bit about some of the the lineup decisions that the Rangers have already made and some decisions that they're going to have to make going forward. And I specifically want to focus in on Jonathan Quick and Matt Rempe. We'll start with Jonathan Quick. Um, So I just propose a question to everybody. Are we ready for Jonathan Quick to start a game? I think it might be about time. And that's not to say that Igor hasn't been great. He has uh, two fantastic games out of three and a third game where he clearly was not at his best, but also got about zero help in that game as well. There was only one goal that you look at and say, man, that, that's a real softie, and he's got to come up with that one. Um, but the bottom line, Igor's been very, very good to the surprise of absolutely nobody. But I was curious to kind of po- propose the question to you guys and kind of wonder at myself here if it's time for Jonathan Quick to get a start. And for reference, I wanted to go back and look at this because I was trying to remember, like, okay, when was the first time that we saw Quick last season? I was thinking it might have been the fourth game, which obviously the Rangers' next game will be their fourth game. I was wrong. It was actually the fifth game of the season for the Rangers was the first time that we saw Jonathan Quick last season. Uh, he made his Ranger debut in Seattle, and the Rangers won that game 4-1. to one. So... I don't know. We may not be quite there yet as far as Laviolette being ready to throw Jonathan Quick into the starting lineup. But at this point, you know, the Rangers, they've got five points out of a possible six. They're they're feeling pretty good about themselves right now. Hasn't been perfect. You know, there's been times where it feels very much like it's early in the season. and The, the Rangers do have some things they have to work on. Um, you know, we, we've talked about some of them playing a complete 60. Um, you know, uh, obviously uh, not over relying on Igor Shesterkin, which they did at times in the second period here. Um, and I think better starts as well. But the bottom line, overall, it's mostly been good for the New York Rangers thus far. But as far as the goalie situation goes, um, I do generally, you know, whether ta- we're talking about the Ranger goalie situation or really any situation in hockey, I like the idea of getting everybody a game somewhat early in the season. Just let them get on the ice and make them feel like they're a part of it. And I think Jonathan Quick, it could be a good time to do that. Another thing to consider here is that you know, the Rangers are playing the Red Wings again. So, that could be a playoff matchup. I mean, in theory, the Rangers could play just about anybody in the playoffs at this point. You know, that, that and a couple of things would have to happen for the Rangers to play the Red Wings. So I'm probably getting very much ahead of myself there. But the bottom line, you know, maybe don't give Detroit two straight looks at Igor Shesterkin, you know, two games in a row. I don't know. It's entirely possible that I'm overthinking it. But when you're playing the same team twice in a row, I think there's times where it does make sense to go the other goalie. And I think that, uh, you know, the Rangers might, want to do that with Jonathan Quick. There, there's no real perfect game for Jonathan Quick to uh, start early in the season because I was looking at the schedule and I'm thinking like, okay, well, maybe there's a back-to-back coming up soon and Quick will play one of those. The Raiders actually don't play their first back-to-back until I, I think it was, it's the very end of November. I think it's like the 29th and the 30th or like the 28th and the 29th, you know, something like that. So it's going to be a while. So sooner or later, you got to give Quick a game, and I'd be all good if uh, if he plays the next one. Or maybe you guys want to hold off a little bit longer and uh, keep throwing Igor out there and keep stacking uh, wins and points early in the season. You let me know. Well, when's the ideal time for Jonathan Quick to get his first start? 
The other player we got to talk about here as far as uh, being in the lineup and his usage is Matt Rempe. Matt Rempe was back on the bench in this one in favor of Johnny Brodzinski. Rempe was the healthy scratch for the second time in three games thus far this season. Uh, Brodzinski was obviously the healthy scratch in the second game of the season. But, you know, you're looking at this, you're looking at Rempe's usage. He has now played, again, just one of the three games, and he got all of three minutes and 40 seconds of ice time in that game. And, of course, that was the game against Utah. Game flow had something to do with it. You know, the Rangers were chasing that game the whole way through. It felt like they were always behind, you know, falling behind by a goal, falling behind by two goals, getting it back down to one goal, back to two goals, eventually tying it. Um, so I can understand that, you know, Rempe's ice time would be down in a game like that. But... I also just don't like the idea, whether it's Rempe or anybody else, of having a player in the lineup who's basically going to be glued to the bench for anything even resembling a high leverage you know, point in the game, basically the whole third period. When you look at Matt Rempe right now, and I realize he's only played one game, and it's early, and this can change, but it kind of feels like, and I'm going by last year a little bit too, it kind of feels like he's only going to play in a situation where the, the stakes are low, at least compared to other portions of the game. You look at the third period, I'm not sure the Rangers right now, the way that they're rolling, are going to put Matt Rempe on the ice in the third period almost under almost any circumstances. You know, maybe if they're like up by three goals or down by three goals, then I'm sure you can you can do it. But it feels like right now, you know, a tight game in the third period, Matt Rempe's just not going to see the ice. And, you know, I, I get it. You know, if, if it's the third period and you're down by a goal, you're and there's five minutes to go, you're going to look to other players before you look to Matt Rempe. So I do understand that. Um, but if that is the case, if, if there's a situation right now where they're just not there yet with Matt Rempe, they just don't trust him in certain situations, then do the kid a solid. This may not seem like a solid, but it is. You send him down to the AHL and you call somebody up in his place. You go, you put Matt Rempe in the AHL. He's certainly going to get more than three minutes and 40 seconds of ice time per night. He'll get to work on some things. He'll get to work on the defensive aspects of his game. Uh, Rempe has talked in the past about wanting to maybe, you know, add penalty killing to his repertoire. He can work on that with the Hartford Wolfpack. Whereas, you know, with the Rangers, I mean, you might see him there every once in a while, the tail end of a penalty kill, uh, maybe, uh, depending who's on the box. Maybe that helps him as well, who's in the box. Um, but right now, it just feels like he has an extraordinarily small role uh, with this Ranger team. And, and that's okay. But I think that you can get the best out of Matt Rempe by sending him to Hartford and giving him, uh, you know, some opportunities going forward. But I'm going to be keeping an eye on what happens in the next game because if there's a situation where Rempe is a healthy scratch in the next game or he plays but plays less than, say, like five minutes, then at that point I'm going to be pretty, you know, all in on, okay, it's time to send Matt Rempe down and call somebody up that you're going to play a little bit more often than two minutes, three minutes, four minutes per night. That's if they're in the lineup in the first place. So, yeah, I, that's kind of where things stand with Matt Rempe. The only other thing that I'll say on the Rempe situation as far as like his usage and, and playing time and whatnot. So a couple, couple weeks ago, we had, or I guess it's probably at least a month ago at this point, but we had the two game rookie series between the Rangers and the Flyers, right? And, you know, who's going to participate and, and all that good stuff. And, and we saw Adam Edstrom there. You know, Edstrom had played 11 games with the Rangers the season before. Uh, Brian Othman was there. He had played three games with the Rangers. Matt Rempe was not there. The Rangers did not send Matt Rempe to that rookie camp. And at first, you know, you see this as a Ranger fan. And if you're a big fan of Matt Rempe, this is actually good news. Because if they're not going to put him on the ice for those rookie games, then clearly they feel that he's, you know, sort of graduated from that. And that he doesn't necessarily have anything to prove against these other rookies. But now we're kind of seeing the opposite. And if there was going to be a situation where early in the season, the Ranger season, regular season, uh, Matt Rempe was only going to play in one of the three games. And in that one game, he was only going to get three minutes and 40 seconds of ice time. Then why is he not being allowed to partake in the rookie games to work on everything there and kind of stake his claim for, you know, a permanent spot in the Ranger lineup once the regular season begins? That's a little bit of a head scratcher. And if you're wondering about like eligibility or whatnot, because Rempe did play, you know, a good amount of games with the Rangers last year and got into some playoff games as well. As far as I know, I've, I've never heard anything to the contrary. Those rookie games between the Rangers and Flyers they're pretty lax as far as the rules go and as far as like who qualifies to play in that game. Now, obviously you're not going to put Chris Kreider into the rookie game. We, we understand that, but as far as like, Oh, he, he's ineligible because he played more than like 15 games for the Rangers last season. I don't think any such rule like that exists. You know, that that's an event. Those two rookie games that are mutually beneficial for both the Rangers and the Flyers. And I really don't think the Flyers were going to you know be upset if, if Rempe played in that game. Although maybe they don't want him, you know, hitting all their rookies around. But uh, again, I don't think there's any requirement. I think it basically just comes down to, you know, the team's discretion, the team's decision. And, and 
if you weren't sure that Matt Rempe was going to be a regular in the lineup, or at least a semi-regular in the lineup, once the regular season began, then he should have been playing in those rookie games and, and being a, given a chance to hone his craft and put his best foot forward and stake his claim to playing time once the regular season began. So it's kind of a head scratcher. Looking back now that he's played so sparingly so far this season that he wasn't in those two rookie games. Uh, the only other player I want to talk about here, as far as, you know, lineup decisions, is Chad Ruedel. He's now, you know, the seventh defenseman for the Rangers. I do wonder if at some point you will see him, you know, slot in for uh, Victor Mancini for a game. I wouldn't do it yet. Uh, Mancini, I feel like, has mostly played well. There's been a couple of hiccups here and there. Um, he did have one goal. He, he was on the ice for a goal against Utah where he basically like chased his guy to the top of the zone. And that, that obviously left the Rangers vulnerable in deep. Um, so there was that, but for the most part, I think Mancini's played well. And I got to shout out Mancini for a play that he made in this game last night. Uh, he had Panarin, he had the puck in the neutral zone. He actually led Victor Mancini up the ice of the pass, you know, over to the right side there. And Mancini gains the blue line and makes just this nasty move. He basically just slips right between two, um, you know, defenders on the play goes to the net. Now the shot was turned aside, but this was a ridiculous move. And we keep hearing about how Mancini was seen as this defenseman with essentially no offensive skills, a true stay at home defenseman. If ever there was one and between this move here, between the fact that he scored a goal that should have never been disallowed in the last game, uh, the fact that he provided some offense in the preseason and in the two rookie games against the Flyers, we're seeing nothing but evidence to the contrary. It seems like, you know, Mancini does have at least some offense to his game on top of just being a big, burly, you know, hopefully hard-hitting defenseman. And overall, I do think he's played well so far. Um, if you look at, you know, what Mancini has done, he's played in all three games, no points. Of course, he did have that one goal disallowed. Um, he's a plus one, seven shots on goal, averaging 15 minutes and 12 seconds of ice time. And uh, already five block shots for Mancini. So sacrificing the body and two hits as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm not exactly dying to see Chad Ruedel in the lineup after I say all those things. But I will say, you know, kind of goes back to what I talked about with Quick. You don't want somebody to be rotting in the press box forever and ever and ever. And all these weeks go by and all these months go by. And then all of a sudden, you know, the Rangers are playing one of their big division rivals, you know, the Islanders the Penguins, the Canes, whoever it might be, and due to some injuries or whatever, now all of a sudden, Chad Ruedel has to go out there and um, you know go toe-to-toe -to -toe with what might be a high-powered offense. Um, so I, I think like with Ruedel, I'd like to see him get into, let's say, one of the first eight or ten games of the season. I don't think you have to do it now. But again, I don't want somebody going ice cold and then being thrown into a difficult situation. I did the same thing. You know, I was thinking maybe the second game of a back-to-back, -back, you can go with Chad Ruedel. But like I said, uh, the Rangers don't play a back-to-back -back until late November. So that opportunity isn't going to be around for a while. I don't know. I really like Mancini. I'm kind of contradicting myself a little bit here. So I want to see Mancini get some rope and obviously stay in the lineup. But I wouldn't mind Chad Ruedel. Let's say the 10th game of the season. Let's get Chad Ruedel a game just to, you know, he's a veteran. He did okay in the five games that he played for the Rangers last season. And um, again, you, you don't want somebody, you know, going completely ice cold watching game after game, month after month from the press box. And that's what can happen, I think, to just about any player. So sooner or later, maybe try to get Rui to a game as well. But I figure we can pretty much call it there. If you guys would like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that's at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.